morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am a designer, I'm a product designer, and I thought I'd talk about what I see as a product designer in the Internet of Things. This is a very famous quote from an artist in the Surrealist movement um, who talked about his love for his wife at the time. I've sort of perverted it for the IoT and uh, trying to think about where we are right now, what are the multiple problems that we face, and the multiple opportunities. This is a map I've been working on for a while. I haven't updated it in a little bit, but it shows a kind of very rapid progression in the ideas that we now qualify as Internet of Things. Um, and really, what we started with were very screenless-based devices, so uh, ideas around the everyday world that was a bit quirky, a bit magical. Some of these products you might recognize. Most of these came out in 2006, 2007. Nothing really included an essential element to our everyday life right now, which is the mobile phone. And in 2007, with smartphones, we kind of see an evolution of those ideas of what an everyday life sort of augmented with connectivity could mean. And now objects have almost taken sort of a, a background sort of position where we see them as extensions to our mobile phone experience. These are three examples of ideas that have been put out there, or two examples of ideas that have been put out there in the last six months, where in essence the object is there to serve a mobile experience. And that is really changing the landscape of how we think about the Internet of Things and really the rise of wearables. There's a big conversation, I think, tomorrow afternoon about this particular topic, but I thought I would point to a, a few different things. One of which is, um, if you looked at it in a particular way, wearables are an interesting way for us to get used to having data captured about us on a day-to-day -day basis. And make that data understandable, possibly useful, um, it's still debatable, but in a way we are slowly starting to become things ourselves. So when we talked about the Internet of Things in 2006, 2007, we meant the everyday world, but really what we're becoming is things ourselves, things that are measurable. Even if I look at my own life, I live in London, I use a um, smart, uh, so an app that uses, that connects to my smart uh, meter at home and I can control my heating, which means that my energy company probably knows when I'm on my way home. Um, Thames Water, which is the water company, knows how much water I use and if you talk to people in the industry, they know that actually uh, the proof of life in a home is not electricity, it's water, because it's you going to the bathroom every once in a while. If I buy things, I will buy them and use maybe a nectar point system, so someone out there knows what I'm buying, when I'm buying it. Uh, Visa certainly collects all that information, even if I use my debit card, even if it's not a credit card. And then I generate a whole bunch of information about myself. So I am, in a way, even now, even without the Internet of Things fully realized, a measurable entity in the world. And there are many different reasons for this, but this, uh, if you're slightly academic, you may want to read this extremely long paper from 2000 uh, that describes a world where no privacy exists. And it's uncanny how much of that paper is still relevant now. But the term I really like in it is this idea of consumer privacy myopia. So the idea that privacy only really matters if I can see the impact immediately. If I can't see the impact immediately of me giving away data, then I will give it away no problem. And at the time, the author uses the example of air miles, because of course air miles at the time was available uh, in 2000, and it's quite an you know, easy way of being able to see where people are going, where, when they're at home, when they're not. So even as a small piece of information, it's quite useful to a number of companies. So we kind of went from uh, traceability being something that was creepy, that was only reserved for people who'd come out of prison, to something that was quite fun in a very limited number of years. And we're using tools like fashion to sell this idea of traceability and trackability. Uh, these are two examples of wearable products out there. Uh, and now there are even products that are 
tracing your child one, you know, when it's born. This is a startup in the United States called Sproutling. I suggest you go and have a look, especially at the comments on the YouTube video. Um, it's internet gold. And so who benefits from this, this traceability ultimately? Um, I'm sure this will come up in the ethics conversation this afternoon, but of course insurance companies are the ones who are the most interested in what's happening to us, where we are, what we actually do, and what we do um, in comparison to what we say we do. So this is a, this is a little bit dystopian, but you know, maybe it'll happen, is that maybe we'll get to a point where data will be something that is associated with stigma. So I'll explain this. At the minute in the United States, if you can't own a car, you can get a car loan. And that loan, of course, has terribly you know, advanced interest rates. But beyond anything else, the car comes with a box that is controllable by the people who give you the loan. And if you do not pay, um, so if you do not make a car payment, they can remotely switch off the car. And so people have been, their cars have stopped in the middle of getting the kids to school or in the middle of highways. Uh, there's a little beeping signal that beeps when you sort of get closer and closer to your payment deadline. So indicating to anyone around you who may be in the car with you that there's kind of something wrong and with the car or is there, I'm just not entirely sure. Maybe you, don't, you haven't told your family that you can't afford this car. And so there's a huge amount of stigma that is already degrading our humanity when it comes to technologies because we want to have access to particular services and companies are sort of willing to give them to us, but at a price to our privacy and our humanity in a way. There's also services and uh, relationships that the insurance companies have built with, of course, gyms. So the more you go to a gym, the lower your premium. And some companies will uh, pay for your gym membership as long as you go. And if you can't prove that you're going, then they will charge you the difference and they'll start charging you the membership. And of course, what's happening, especially these schemes are very popular in large corporations, um, as part of sort of an employment contract, what's happening is that people are signing into the gym, putting something in their locker and then signing out again because they know that all that matters is that they've seen, they're seen to go through the building. And so even with these systems which are meant to help us, we know how to game them and we know how to use our humanity to our advantage. But this has of course limited impact because when that information is coupled with a Fitbit or a wearable device then that company can actually know if you're going to the gym and exercising as opposed to just checking in. So this idea of stigma is very much about uh, the idea that if you can't afford things, suddenly traceability becomes a requirement in a way. If you have health problems, my father has cancer, um, he can't get travel insurance unless his uh, medication doesn't change for six months. And so that traceability, being able to tell that you know, his medication hasn't changed is something that will be done automatically. And so if he starts to try to travel, then he won't be able to at all. He won't be even able to kind of fake his way into traveling. And of course, security and um, you know, the way in which we build these systems in order for them to be secure is also you know, a sort of minefield in itself. Um, in the UK, these are two headlines from the UK in the past six months, one of which was a fridge that was spamming everyone, um, and the other one was a, a man who hacked into a baby monitor and started screaming at the baby. Um, and these are things that will always exist and these are problems that will exist but how we build those systems, how we build security for those systems, how that product takes a space in our life that suddenly is a new space. So it's not just a fridge, it's not just a baby monitor anymore, it's not just a scale. It's an object that does something else and therefore is hackable in new ways that we hadn't really imagined. But there's still space for unpredictability. Again, our humanity kind of trumps these things and knows how to game these things. This is a very underdocumented episode, but for a very, very limited period of time, a few days, and I think 2006, 2007, 
um, the Fitbit had a security breach in a way. Um, so what would happen is they would give early users of their early versions of the Fitbit, which was this clippable version, um, access to a graph and they could tag their graph and their activity. Of course, if you give any good geek information and the way to tag things, they will tag things that perhaps aren't so politically correct, let's say. And so people were tagging where, when they were having intercourse. And so for a short period of time, if you Googled someone's name, the first thing that would come up was this little graph showing when the last time they had sex which obviously they took down, they kind of rebuilt their security systems very, very quickly, but this is what people do when given tools and when given technologies. They will use it for ways that are unpredictable. And so that, in a way, should make us feel hopeful about our ability to build systems that when people do want to use them, they'll use them above and beyond what we've created for them. And people will be very aware of dissent. This is, um, and use technologies for their own means. This is a art student in London who has decided that she was going to try to take advantage as much as she possibly could of the data that she knew she was producing and try to get money from all of the companies that were accessing her data or wanting to access her data. So what she did was she registered herself as a company. And so she is now trying to trade her data out to these different companies that would otherwise not really ask for your permission, but because she's a registered entity, she uh, is trying to have a conversation with these companies on a completely different level. And there are many different companies that are trying to show us that data is not just something that kind of floats out of the air and exists somewhere else for someone else's value. Um, a very, very interesting startup, um, I'm one of their advisors and they're really lovely, called Bellua. I suggest you go have a look at the Vimeo um, uh, video. And it's really, what they want to do is be a search engine that allows us to understand what's happening with our data, use it in an interesting way, and actually use it to our benefit. Um, and, and you know, other examples and other companies are kind of doing things around this. All that to say that the Internet of Things is not just a conversation about technology. It's a conversation about design and it's a conversation about products and how they're used and how they're misused and how they're forgotten. Because all these things have an impact on data ultimately. And, you know, a great example of sort of that mix being misunderstood is, of course, Google Glass, who are now desperately trying to work with fashion designers two years after having designed something. And anybody who works with design and understand designs knows that you should involve a designer from the beginning, not two years after designing something. And, you know, that's meant, of course, that people are very willing to sort of get rid of these objects very, very quickly. And that's also really detrimental to an idea of sustainability and an idea of building products that stay with us. We live in a world where heavy materials are more and more expensive to human life, that where exploitation exists everywhere when it comes to electronics, electronics manufacturing, and we have to be more responsible about making experiments in the world. And sometimes, really, the answer is not hardware at all. So the idea of a smart fridge, you know, maybe is completely flawed from the beginning because what I really want is a list of things that I can keep a hold of that tells me how long ago I bought that thing that's in the back of the drawer. It's not even in the fridge. It's somewhere else in the kitchen. But that's just a smart list. It's not a smart fridge because I don't really need a smart fridge. And the idea that global players have it all figured out is also flawed. I think there's a lot of hope for anybody who wants to get into the space right now, who's a small player, who's a startup. Um, even Google, on the energy side, had experimented with the Google Power Meter that they launched and then closed down and eventually bought Nest. So they're still trying to figure out um, how this all works and how this all connects to people and why people want to buy things. But they also shouldn't be the only ones educating people. People need to know about what happens to their data, and large data providers are probably not the people who need to hear from this, and I'm hoping that the EU Commission is planning on doing something around this. Another sort of homework for anybody in the room, this is Germany, you're a great industrial nation. Um, there should be a way for us to agree on how we communicate to consumers that an object is connected 
that data sits somewhere. And in manufacturing, we sort of vaguely agreed on ways in which we can communicate that an object is recyclable. Why wouldn't it be the same thing about connectivity? Every single connected object has to have a stamp on it with a tiny URL that points to where the data is sat so that that consumer can archive it, can delete it, can do whatever they want with it. But they know that there's something there that's being gathered. And I'm running out of time. Another ridiculous idea, but I think this has legs maybe, again for you to think about, is the idea of value. We're very happy sort of giving data away, but maybe there's a really interesting conversation to be had where we do get given value back. So, you know, maybe there's an opportunity there for consumers to make very small amounts of money from their data. It's something very, very, um, in a way, um, just a gesture, but it would be an interesting gesture because it would recognize that value is being made from data with consumers, and it would be a sort of thank you. Thank you for allowing us to build a lot of value in the world. And that's it for me, and I hope that you do keep in touch. I'm usually found on Twitter, and I hope you enjoy the next two days of building value for people.